Regrooving for scarcity is an experience, not a conversation. I'm Kelly Rhodes with Body and Behavior Institute. In affordable housing neighborhoods, there's typically a mix of families. Some have lost their homes due to exorbitant medical bills, work injuries, or children born with illness. Some recently suffered the loss of a breadwinner. And a few have spent decades without homes and have decided to trust society one more time. These amazing human beings have often raised their children under bridges, in abandoned sheds, makeshift tents on the streets, or moving from shelter to shelter. After school programs in these settings usually start with a snack. There's often a, a table lined with paper plates filled with donated snack food. In these settings, it's not uncommon for a child adapted for scarcity to meander over to the table, pocket the food from one plate, then sit in another seat in front of a full plate. When kids tattle on them, a well-meaning volunteer might admonish the child with familiar phrases. There's only enough for one plate for each person, or we don't steal. The first statement is rarely true. More importantly, these statements run the youth's groove for scarcity, strengthening the scarcity sensation and increasing the likelihood the youth will pocket food again. Through many first-hand experiences, this child's healthy systems, his survival systems, learned that food was not predictably available to him. Each time he saw food, thought about food, spoke of food, dreamed of food, or watched others eating, and food was not available to him, his survival systems forged neural circuitry for food insecurity. For people working with youth adapted for food insecurity, our task is to help the youth's survival systems experience that in this environment, food is predictable. An effective tool is to invite the youth adapted for food insecurity to be snack helper. When snack time comes, the task remains authentic, filling the plates with food for the kids. However, the delivery is uniquely modified to trigger and regroove a survival system with sensations of food insecurity to one with sensations of abundance. Simply inviting the child into the pantry where large bins of donated food are stored triggers food insecurity neural circuitry in youth with these experiences. Placing plastic serving gloves on the child's hands and inviting them to help put food on the plates cues their survival system to expect to actually hold food and experience with greater potential to eat. These are sequential events that increase dopamine activation relevant to food. Each time a survival system in food insecurity sees food, it fires a signal that says, I need that. It doesn't say, I want a lot of that. And it doesn't say, I need that for later. It says, I need that. Rather than bringing the food from the bin to the plates, which would trigger a dip in dopamine activation, I add a step. I bring the food from the bin directly to the child's mouth. This triggers a spike in dopamine. What follows somewhat resembles the chocolate factory episode from the Lucille Ball show. I take a handful of cheese cubes, apple slices, crackers, or cookies, and without hesitation, with one hand, I put them in the child's mouth. And with the other hand, I put some on each of the plates lined up on the counter. This child's dopaminergic system is experiencing sequential dopamine spikes for immediate access to food and simultaneously a dopamine spike for future access to food. Every time I reach into the bins, 
his survival system is triggered for scarcity. So I always keep one food item in the hand I use to place food in his mouth. The instant his eyes see me reach into the bin with my other hand, my hand with the food item places food in his mouth. Timing is everything to the dopaminergic system. In order to cultivate adaptation from scarcity to abundance, the food must be perceived as available for his consumption the instant that neural circuitry is triggered. In essence, my hand with a snack item is racing the firing of his synapse for scarcity. From the dopaminergic system's perspective, there are no steps or delays between the triggered desire and the receipt of the resource. The timing becomes even more impeccable when my hand presents a food item to his mouth as he's preoccupied chewing the food I put in his mouth a few seconds before. His survival system's first visual of the food occurs simultaneously to when it is experienced touching his tongue. The synapse fires, he gets a dopaminergic spike, and his mouth opens and receives the food in the same instant. And he can see me placing more food on the plates for later. Often the children chew and swallow as quickly as possible to prepare to receive the next potential food item. A full mouth can't be the reason timing is interrupted. I let them know we're not in a hurry, and I invite them to chew slowly. When their mouth is full, I place food in their hands. When their mouth and both hands are full, I invite them to put the newly offered snack in their pocket. Then I fill the empty hand as I'm filling plates. When their mouth, hands, pockets, and plates are all full, I quickly cease any triggering behavior. I invite them to grab the plate they want. And while they're choosing their plate, I quickly close the bins and exit the room, inviting them to follow me, each of us holding a full plate. With their mouth and pockets overflowing, they carry their full plate to the table and take a seat. The children often return the following day wearing their older siblings' pants, deeper pockets. Experience is the language of our survival systems. Regrooving does not happen if we tell the child he can get more if he wants more, or if we set a plate off to the side for him to have later, or put extra food on his plate. Each of these alternatives requires he wait, which is a delay to the dopaminergic system. The dopaminergic system perceives weight as the resource not being available and forges deeper scarcity grooves. For regrooving to be effective, each time a system in scarcity perceives food, it must receive food. Before the system can be disappointed, before it can steal it, before it can enlist the neocortex to negotiate for it or strategize a method to get it, before any other event can occur, the food must be predictably delivered directly to their mouth. In my experience, it typically takes about three weeks before the child's survival system perceives food to be predictable in this environment. I know their survival system has made that transition when, that, when I invite them to be snack helper and they say, I'm good, Miss Kelly, I don't need to be snack helper anymore. When their survival systems integrate the new experiences, the adaptive behaviors, resource vigilance, pocketing and hiding food, cease. If that child continues to receive predictable food in their home and school environment, their new or strengthened abundance neural circuitry will remain deep and behaviorally predictive years into the future. This child can receive the runt cupcake at a birthday party and not even notice. Scarcity is learned and can only be unlearned through repeated experiences. I'm Kelly Rhodes with Body and Behavior Institute.
If you found value in this video, please give it a thumbs up or subscribe.